Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 204 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Aaron Burr is a really interesting figure. Here's a man who fought and served heroically in the War for Independence, who served in state and national government, and who ended his political career with service as vice president of the United States. Now, all of that is enough to make him an interesting figure. But on top of that, we can add that he shot and killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel, and he's been charged with orchestrating a plan to capture a large part of the Mississippi Valley, and perhaps even parts of Spanish Florida and Mexico, to create a second independent nation in North America. That's right. Aaron Burr supposedly intended to commit treason by dividing the American Union. Intrigued? I hope so, because this episode is about the Burr conspiracy. James Lewis Jr., a professor of history at Kalamazoo College and author of The Burr Conspiracy, uncovering the story of an early American crisis, will serve as our guide through what we know and what we don't know about Aaron Burr's supposed plot to divide the Union. Now, as we explore this bit of early American intrigue, James reveals details about Aaron Burr and his political career, what the Burr conspiracy entailed and why it captivated the attention of Americans during the 19th century, and how Americans followed and grappled with the Burr conspiracy both while it unfolded and during and after Burr's trial for treason. But first, I'm coming to the Big Easy. I'll be in New Orleans on Monday, October 29, to give the Michael Mizzle Nelson Memorial Lecture at the University of New Orleans. It should be a really fun event, and it's open and free to all who want to attend. Now, I still need to settle on a specific topic, but I will be talking about podcasts and why they're such a great tool for history and historians, which really means I'll be talking a lot about Ben Franklin's world. Now, unfortunately, my trip to New Orleans will be really quick, just one day, so I won't have enough time to host a formal meetup. I'd still really love to meet you while I'm in town, and we can definitely meet and chat for a bit after the lecture. Plus, we'll also have that post-lecture Q&A time, which is usually my favorite part of any lecture. So you can use that time, too, to introduce yourself and to ask me any questions you have about history or the podcast. I'll post the details for the event in the show notes. But again, I'll be speaking at the University of New Orleans on October 29 at 6 p.m. And I really hope I see you there. Okay. I hope you're ready for a bit of adventure and mystery today, because it's time to head back to the early American West and investigate the Burr Conspiracy. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of history at Kalamazoo College and an expert in early American foreign policy. He's the author of four books, including The Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson's Noble Bargain, and most recently, The Burr Conspiracy, uncovering the story of an early American crisis, which was a finalist for the 2018 George Washington Book Prize. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, James Lewis Jr. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us, James. Now, we're really curious about the Burr Conspiracy. And before we dive into the particulars of this early American crisis, would you tell us a bit about Aaron Burr? I mean, Burr seems to be someone that we always remember generally, but The details of his life are not always top of mind. So would you tell us about Aaron Burr? Sure. Well, I think in the current climate, there's more knowledge of Burr through the Hamilton musical than there probably was 10 years ago. And Burr is in some ways uh, very different from Hamilton. Burr came from quite a prominent family, but they're pretty similar in age and in some ways similar in experience. Burr, like Hamilton, really rose to some sort of prominence during the American Revolution, led a... uh, very famous, though not ultimately successful, military campaign into Canada and Quebec in 1775 at the very, very beginning of the revolution, where Hamilton stayed in Washington's good graces throughout the war. Burr, like many American officers, ultimately had something of a falling out with Washington. He got on the wrong side of the most important person in the revolution. 
drifted off, left the military, became a prominent lawyer in New York City, which of course Hamilton would as well. In the 1790s, when Hamilton is becoming a key figure in the emerging Federalist Party, Burr is emerging in politics as well, but tending towards the other party, the party of Jefferson, the party of the Republicans or Democratic Republicans. And that's what leads him to his sort of first great national moment, where he is a candidate for the presidential election in 1800 on the Republican side. He's really seen as the vice presidential candidate in some ways, but the way the Constitution was set up, it didn't really distinguish between candidates in the way that it does today and has since the early 19th century. And the result of that was that in 1800, Burr and Jefferson defeated the Federalist candidate, John Adams, but were tied with each other. And so the election of 1800 was thrown into the House of Representatives, and the Federalists backed Burr while the Republicans backed Jefferson. Jefferson ultimately emerged as the president, Burr as the vice president, but there was friction between the two from the beginning largely as a result of the process by which they came to office. And Burr served out a single term as vice president. It was late in that that the famous duel with Hamilton occurred. Yeah. Speaking of that duel, Burr shot Alexander Hamilton on July 11, 1804. And Raymond and John would like to know how the American people reacted to Burr's role in Hamilton's death and how the perception of honor politics, which is what the duel was a part of, impacted Burr's reputation and political career after 1804. It's interesting. Of course, he continued to serve out his term as vice president. He got out of New York and New Jersey, where he was pretty quickly under indictment and spent a little while sort of underground or at least discreet. But the further south he moved, he discovered he was actually pretty popular. And so by the time he came back north from Georgia in the fall of 1804, He was being feted in the various towns that he proceeded through, most of which were Republican towns and cities, on his way back to Washington, D.C. In some ways, it certainly hurt his political reputation, but in some ways, it was the frictions with Jefferson and the leadership of the Republican Party that did even more damage. He remained popular with some Republicans, particularly in parts of the South and in the West. Now, the Burr conspiracy is an event that has had some staying power in American memory. I mean, not only did it captivate the attention of Americans as it took place, but it captivated the attention of Americans well into the 19th century and really even beyond. So, James, what exactly was the Burr conspiracy? Would you tell us about the conspiracy in broad terms so that we can better understand and discuss the specifics as we continue along? Well, there's a lot of mystery surrounding that. The story, though, that has really come down throughout the 19th century and into much of the 20th century was that Burr and a group of other men decided to divide the United States at the Appalachian Mountains to take the Mississippi Valley states and territories out of the Federal Union and establish their own empire in the West, centered probably on New Orleans. That may have extended even further. It may have included parts of Spanish Florida or Spanish Mexico. So the grand version of it, the version that was frequently presented in plays and in novels throughout the 19th century, was this disunionist project, which is obviously a treasonous project. There were other things talked about and ideas that it was, in fact, limited to attacking Spanish Florida or Spanish Mexico. But when we think about the Burr conspiracy, we're really thinking about this possibility, at least, that Burr and others were planning to divide the Union. Did Burr embark on this plan to divide the Union after he finished his term as vice president in 1805? Or was this something that he was planning while he was vice president? Well, I want to be careful how we say this. That's the story that's been ascribed to Burr, but it's not entirely clear that that was ever Burr's plan. We just don't have the evidence to say that for certain. It is clear, though, that even in that last winter of his vice presidency in 1804, he was already looking at maps, talking with people, and setting his sights on the West. Now, how far West is the question? Was it the West beyond the mountains or was it the West of New Orleans and even of Mexico and Florida? That's uncertain. One of the curious things to me about this conspiracy is that a conspiracy is supposed to be secret. It's a secret plan. Yet when we read your book, The Burr Conspiracy, we get the sense that the American people kind of follow Burr as he made his way West and as this supposed conspiracy unfolded. We also know that the early 19th century wasn't the age of the 24-hour news cycle and that 
people didn't really learn about things in real time. So would you tell us how they learned about the conspiracy? How exactly did information about this supposedly secret plan become known to the American people? And how did information about it circulate around the United States as it did? Well, as early as the summer of 1805, when Burr is on his first tour of the West after leaving the vice presidency, things start to show up in newspapers occasionally. But it's really the next year, the summer of 1806, when he heads again to the West, that the newspapers start to be filled with rumors and reports that shows up in letters. It's clearly showing up in conversations. So, of course, that's harder to find evidence of. So sometime over sort of the winter of 1805, 1806 and the spring of 1806, suspicions of Burr start to mount. And they start to show up in the media of the day. And the media of the day is very interesting. It was highly partisan with very little pretense of objectivity, far more so than is the case today when we think of ourselves as having a highly partisan media. Initially, that didn't matter too much. Both Federalists and Republican newspapers are concerned about Burr's movements, who he's talking with, what he's doing in the West. But over time, that would matter a lot and it would shape how the stories of Burr developed and how they kind of get entrenched in American thinking. Speaking of those stories, Elizabeth would like to know more about how newspapers portrayed Burr. Did these highly partisan newspapers you mentioned portray Burr in highly partisan ways? And did they universally decry his activities? Certainly by the spring of 1807 and beyond, you see that dynamic that Federalist papers, despite the fact that Burr had killed their hero, become very defensive of him, are convinced that there's no conspiracy that Burr had only honest ends in view, and that Jefferson has whipped up this furor, and Jefferson's Republican editors have whipped up this furor in order to destroy a potential political rival. And Republican newspapers by the spring of 1807 and beyond are convinced that Burr is, in fact, a traitor. Jefferson had publicly stated this in a message to Congress in January of 1807, that his guilt of treason was beyond question. And Republican papers take that and run with it, and they are convinced that he is a traitor and that he should be put on trial, and that, of course, the punishment for treason is death. What exactly did these partisan newspapers stand to gain by taking such a partisan view of Burr and his activities in travel? The whole structure of the newspapers was based on their ties to political parties. That's what kept them afloat. That's what many of the people who were editors of the newspapers were, in fact, politically active. And in some communities, they were the most important political actors. They were the ones who helped to organize that party on the local level. So their very existence depended on being linked to a party. They're just a handful of papers that try to maintain some degree of political independence. And most of them aren't very successful and don't last very long. Now, Burr was supposedly touring and causing trouble in the Orleans Territory. This territory wasn't a place filled with lots of Americans and American towns during the early 19th century. So how exactly did Americans back east and along the Appalachian Mountains in places like Kentucky and Tennessee hear of Burr's activities? How is it that news of Burr is able to travel from this very frontier region to establish American settlements? Well, it takes lots of forms. There are a couple of newspapers in New Orleans and there are newspapers in the neighboring Mississippi Territory. And those newspapers are moving around fairly easily, though everything is slow. And it seems terrifyingly slow in the winter of 1806, 1807, when the crisis is at its height. The mails seem to be going more slowly than they should. And people are alarmed at one point that Burr has somehow intercepted the mails, corrupted the mail system, and so preventing news from traveling. The news is also traveling in simply letters. And a lot of what shows up in Eastern newspapers are, in fact, letters from various Western places reporting what's going on in their community. You can't always use a local newspaper to know what's going on in that locale. This doesn't make sense to us today. So I always take an example from the present to explain it to my students. So I'm at a school of 1,500 students. Kalamazoo College has a student newspaper, as most schools do. The index comes out, I think, on Thursday afternoons. You do not wait for the index to come out on Thursday afternoon to know what's going on on your campus, right? There are 2,000 people, faculty, staff, and students who are on campus. They know what's going on long before the newspaper comes out. And the same is true in 
even a city as large as New Orleans or a town like uh, Natchez, they're not waiting on the local newspaper to know what's going on in their locale. So the local newspapers are often carrying stuff from elsewhere. And you can't always pick up what's going on in the place you're studying by looking at the newspapers in that place. One of the activities the newspapers we've been talking about reported on was Burr's adventures in Kentucky. What exactly was Burr doing in Kentucky, James? Why was Kentucky even a place that Burr stopped on his Western travels? Well, any question that includes the word exactly, I'm a little dubious about. We don't entirely know. Both in 1805 on his first Western tour and again in 1806, he spent a lot of time in Kentucky, particularly Lexington and Frankfurt, but also Louisville. And he was meeting with prominent men, many of whom in that case were leading Republicans, people that he knew sometimes from his role as the presiding officer of the Senate. And they had connected him to some of the leading Republicans in Kentucky. One thing he did in the fall of 1806 is to arrange to buy a claim to some land in the new Louisiana Purchase, a claim that allowed him to say at the very least that all I'm going to do is settle land, that there's nothing nefarious in my plans at all. I'm just bought a lot of land and I need to bring people out to settle it. He also did a lot of traveling sort of from that base and included in those travels were a couple of visits to a guy named Harmon Blennerhassett, who owned a big chunk of an island in the Ohio River, Blennerhassett Island. And that would become something of a staging area for Burr's men in the late fall early winter of 1806, as they made their way down the Ohio River, headed towards wherever, New Orleans, wherever they might have ultimately been going to. Now, again, a conspiracy is supposed to be a secret. And yet, Aaron Burr doesn't seem to be any good at keeping his activities a secret because while he's in Kentucky, he stood as a defendant in two trials. Why and how did Aaron Burr end up in front of two Kentucky courts? Well, that's an interesting story. One of the earliest people to let Jefferson and the administration know about Burr's activities in the West and to make them a part of a grand conspiracy was a guy named Joseph Hamilton Davis, and he was the federal district attorney in Kentucky. And he brought Burr into court twice in the fall of 1806 and accused him of, he's really thinking treason, but it accused him at the very least of planning an illegal invasion of Spanish Mexico or Spanish Florida. And he can't produce the witnesses to actually make the case stick either time. And so Burr walks free in December of 1806 after these two failed attempts to prosecute him. What's interesting about Burr's two trials in Kentucky is that they really seem to play into fears that people in Kentucky had about an earlier event called the Spanish Association Conspiracy. Would you tell us about that conspiracy and why it really concerned the people of Kentucky? Well, the Spanish conspiracy had actually come much earlier. It was in the 1780s and 1790s. But in the summer of 1806, a Kentucky newspaper, a Frankfurt newspaper called The Western World, began to put together the history of the Spanish conspiracy on the pages of the newspaper and to imply that this was, in fact, either an ongoing conspiracy or a newly revived conspiracy. And that some of the same men who had been involved in the so-called Spanish conspiracy of the late 1780s, this is a time when Kentucky was still a part of Virginia. And the idea was, is Kentucky going to break free of Virginia? And in doing so, is it also going to break free of the new United States entirely and find some sort of separate arrangement with Spain? So it had seemed worrisome to some in the 1780s and early 1790s. And the fears of it are revived in 1806 by these newspaper articles. And Burr isn't really covered a lot in the story. He hadn't been a part of the Spanish conspiracy in the 1780s and early 90s. But somebody who's linked with General James Wilkinson, the commanding general of the U.S. Army, had been a part of the conspiracy, the so-called Spanish conspiracy. And so Burr's name starts to show up occasionally in the newspapers. And then when he arrives in the West in the late summer and early fall of 1806, it starts to show up with even greater frequency. And there start to be a number of Western newspapers in Kentucky and Ohio that have alarmist essays and articles about what Burr is up to. The escalation about how people thought and talked about Burr and his activities fit within a larger theme that James reported on throughout his book, The Burr Conspiracy. And that larger theme was a fear of disunion. James, would you tell us about the West and why so many Americans during the early 19th century 
seem to really fear that the Union of the United States might fall apart? Sure. This is a very fragile thing in their mind. The union of these states that even after the Constitution retain some important elements of sovereignty. And they look at histories of the ancient world, of modern Europe. They look at former efforts to maintain unions, and they have never really succeeded. Just as former efforts to maintain Republican governments have never really succeeded. And they believe very strongly that you can't have Republican governments in North America without having all of the states connected together into a single union. That if you end up with multiple confederacies or with multiple independent nations, they're going to have to do the things that European nations have done to protect themselves. And what do they see in Europe? They don't see any republics. They see monarchies. So they're afraid that to lose the union, to divide up in some way, would cost them these republican governments that they just fought so hard for. And we're talking not even 40 years after American independence. So it's a profound fear, and it very much shapes their thinking. We know, of course, that the Union will divide in 1861, and we know that it will divide on a line that separates the North from the South. They really weren't thinking in those terms. They were really thinking that the most important division that they could see was a line between the East and West, because it's very hard to move people, goods, and in some ways even information back and forth across the Appalachian Mountains. That seemed like the natural divider, the natural border in North America that should really be separating at least two nations, one east of the mountains and one west of the mountains connected by the Mississippi River and its various tributaries. Given that it was so difficult to connect goods, people, and information across the Appalachian Mountains, Rosa and Marie are curious about the national identity of Americans who lived west of those mountains. Did Western settlers really feel connected to the United States east of those mountains? Or did they feel connected, but also disconnected in ways that allowed them to write their own laws and do what they wanted because they questioned who would stop them? Well, this was, of course, the great concern at the time for Easterners is how loyal is the West? And if you go back 20 years before the Burr conspiracy, I think there were reasons to see things in the way that she has suggested, that these people were only loosely attached to the United States. Their loyalties were untested and uncertain. By 1806, even though there's a lot of fear about what the West might do, there were good reasons for Westerners to be loyal to the federal government and to the American Union. And when the suspicion started to be voiced in Eastern newspapers, Westerners were very quick to say, oh, no, 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 we are totally loyal. We get everything we want out of this arrangement. And they were largely correct. The things that they had really needed in previous years, protection from Native American tribes in the West, access to land, self-government, and most importantly, access to the Mississippi River and use of the Mississippi River all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Those things had been achieved in the preceding decade or so. And they could point to those things and say, we have no reason whatsoever to follow the ambitious Burr in any sort of secessionist project. Now, earlier you mentioned that the federal attorney for Kentucky brought charges against Burr in the Kentucky courts for various illegal activities he thought Burr was engaged in. And that it was these lawsuits that brought Burr and his supposed conspiracy to the attention of President Thomas Jefferson. Did Jefferson and his administration ever issue any sort of response to Burr's trials and supposed activities as a preemptive measure to keep Burr from committing treason in the West? Or did they just kind of follow along and keep tabs on Burr as he moved forward? Well, it's a little earlier than the trials. The trials are in November and December. Davies's warnings had started coming as early as February. And by the Late summer, early fall of 1806, there's enough going on in newspapers, not just Western newspapers, but also Eastern papers, that Jefferson decides the cabinet needs to meet and decide what its approach should be. And so a series of three cabinet meetings in October of 1806. And at that series of three cabinet meetings, the administration decides on its approach to the rumors about Burr. And they have to be a little bit cautious. They don't know whether Wilkinson, the commanding general of the army, is reliable or not. They don't know whether he's a part of this conspiracy. That's certainly what a lot of Western newspapers were suggesting. And they take a pretty guarded approach. And one reason is they don't have all the information they would like. 
One reason is that they particularly don't know what they need to know about Wilkinson. And the other reason is that they have a very strong commitment to the Constitution and to a strict construction of the language of the Constitution. And Jefferson sends James Madison, his Secretary of State, off to figure out what can we do? Can we arrest Burr for conspiring to commit treason, for making preparations to commit treason? And in fact, Madison comes back and reports, no, we can't. There's no law that says it's illegal to stockpile supplies, to recruit men, even to train men to commit treason, to levy war against the United States. We can't go after him for that. There is a law that says that it's illegal to make those kind of preparations to attack a country at peace with the United States. So if first target was Mexico or Florida, then they can step in. What they decide to do is to send an agent, a guy named John Graham, to follow Burr, to collect information, and to talk with state officials and territorial officials in the West and put whatever information he has before them and leave it, in a sense, in the hands of the states and the local officials to decide whether it has reached a level that Burr could be stopped for, could be arrested for. So it sounds like the Jefferson administration really lacked enough information to act against Burr. And it also sounds like even if it had a bit more information, it wouldn't necessarily have been able to act preemptively against Burr. Yeah, but it has to decide what to do, even without all the information it wishes it had. And Jefferson thinks that they have done enough. And in the aftermath of the conspiracy, when everything is clearly resolved, he really touts the fact that it has taken so little to prevent this. The most important thing he ultimately does is to issue in late November of 1806, issue a presidential proclamation in which he says to the American people, you may think that all these preparations in the West are supported by the government. They're not. If you're involved in them, get out of them. If you're a state or federal official in the West and you see anything illegal going on, stop it. And that has a huge impact on the ability of Burr to get men together for whatever the project may be. His ability to move easily is affected by that as well. So Jefferson is very proud of the fact, something he boasts often. In Europe, it would have taken armies to suppress something like this. But in America, all it took was letting the people know where the government stood on this issue, that it was opposed to this, and that's enough to defeat it. And the cooperation of the states, that's really all it took. And how did Congress react to all of this, to Burr and Jefferson's response to Burr? Well, Congress was as mystified as everybody else in the early stages of its session. Congress didn't meet year round at that time. It came into session in early December of 1806 and met for the next four months, I guess. It was a Congress dominated by Republicans. They were willing to give Jefferson a little bit of freedom to decide what the best approach to this was, but constantly wanted more information. What do you know? Is there something we should be doing to help support your efforts to defeat this potential threat? And eventually, sort of a fringe anti-administration group of Republicans were able to build enough pressure to force Jefferson to provide some information and to give an account of what was going on and what the administration had done to defeat it. This became a very important message. It's the longest message of Jefferson's presidency, his two terms as president. It's one he wrote himself, where a lot of other important messages, he got a lot of help from his cabinet officials. And it really laid out his story of what was happening, a story that made very clear that Burr was guilty of treason, and of what the administration had done, and in a way that made it sound like the administration had moved very quickly on its information, but had still really relied on the states and the people to do what was right and to put down any sort of conspiracy that existed. Now, I'd like for us to fast forward to February 1807, when the United States government arrested Aaron Burr in the Mississippi Territory. But before we get into that story, let's take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. As we've been discussing, Aaron Burr was a powerful figure who, like many in the founding generation, wanted to push American settlement further west and further south. Although, unlike the other founders, with Burr, we do have to wonder whether he intended to push the new American Republic further south and further west, or whether he wanted to push farther south and farther west 
in order to start his own independent nation. Regardless, the land Burr and his co-conspirators had their eyes on was a rich place. It was the home of different peoples and a place where different empires competed for dominance. Even before Burr made his move west, Americans along the East Coast eyed the region with a lot of interest. But how did Burr and his contemporaries gain information about this vast and wild region? In the Omohundro Institute's newest book, Frontiers of Science, Imperialism and Natural Knowledge in the Gulf South Borderlands, 1500 to 1750, author Cameron Strang explores how the people of the Gulf South generated scientific knowledge. Now, although many in early America saw the Northeast as the home of American scientific thought and learned societies, people who lived in the Gulf South, Indian sages, African slaves, Spanish officials, and Irishmen on the make, also generated scientific knowledge and joined scientific conversations as they observed, gathered, organized, and reported on the skulls, stems, birds, bugs, rocks, and other natural phenomenon that they came across and found. They also generated hypotheses about these things and sent the knowledge they made to people back east. If you're curious about this fascinating exchange of scientific ideas between the settled east and the vast west of North America, you should check out Cameron Strang's book, Frontiers of Science. You can check it out by visiting benfranklinsworld.com science. And if you like what you see, use our special listener-only promo code 01BFW. And the Omohundro Institute's publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press, will give you a 50% discount. Again, visit benfranklinsworld.com science and use our promo code 01BFW. Okay, now it's time to fast forward to February 1807 and Aaron Burr's arrest in the Mississippi Territory. James, how did Burr's arrest go down? Who ordered his arrest and what charges did they arrest him on? Well, that becomes a very tricky issue. His arrest wasn't exactly ordered by anyone. He had been put on trial in the Mississippi Territory. And once again, the trial justice in Kentucky had failed and he had left Mississippi and headed east and had left behind his men and his boats and supplies in the Natchez area and was traveling someplace, and it's not entirely clear where. It was potentially back to the east, maybe to Washington, D.C., he would later say, to try to clear his name. But uh, there was also reason to think he was heading possibly for Spanish Mobile in what's now Alabama, but was then a Spanish fort and town. And it was north of Mobile that he was arrested by a U.S. Army officer, Edmund Pendleton Gaines, and an American official, but not a real legal official. He worked in the land office in that area. They picked him up. They decided that uh, he needed to be taken to Washington and that the people in Washington would know what was best to do with him. And so really, without having a chance to get official orders, which would have taken weeks, if not months, from either the commanding general in New Orleans, that would have probably been two or three weeks to get that, or from the administration in Washington, which would have been a couple of months at least, they set out with Perkins, the guy who identified him, Perkins and a group set out with Burr to take him to Washington, D.C. They get a message when they're in Fredericksburg to turn around, go back to Richmond, and we're going to put him on trial there. Before we start digging into the details of Burr's trial, could we talk a bit about his supposed co-conspirators? Specifically, Kyle is really interested in James Wilkinson who, as you mentioned earlier, was the American general in charge of safeguarding New Orleans in the West. So, James, would you tell us about Wilkinson and how he came to be seen as a possible co-conspirator of Burr's? Yeah, Wilkinson makes Burr look straightforward. Wilkinson was a very slippery character. His past had been a past of constantly running into tensions. He is involved in something called the Conway Cabal and the Revolutionary War, an anti-Washington group. He gets involved in the Spanish conspiracy in Kentucky in the 1780s and early 1790s. But ultimately, he rises to the highest position in the U.S. Army. He's the commanding general of the U.S. Army at the time Jefferson enters office in early 1801. He's also at that moment a paid Spanish spy in regular correspondence or semi-regular correspondence with various Spanish officials, both in North America and beyond and providing them with information. He tells them at one point to intercept the Lewis and Clark expedition, for example. And yet he's also clearly involved with Burr in some way. They meet together on a couple of occasions when he's appointed governor of what was actually the Louisiana Territory, which isn't modern Louisiana, but his base was in St. Louis. 
Burr comes out and visits him there. So there are at least potentially three, certainly two loyalties. And of course, there's always the most important loyalty of Wilkinson's, which is to himself. And he becomes the most important voice against Burr. He provides a very famous document called the Cipher Letter, a letter in code that Burr had sent Wilkinson in the summer of 1806 that said, essentially, our plans are matured, we're ready to go, and we're going off to meet the people who are waiting for us. It's a vague letter. It doesn't say exactly who the people are who were waiting for Burr and Wilkinson to show up. It's not entirely clear how much Wilkinson is to be involved, how much he would have already known about the project. But it becomes a crucial letter. It's a letter that Jefferson sends to Congress and to the people to say, here's my evidence that Burr was planning treason. Do we know if Burr really wrote the cipher letter? And how could we read this letter if it was written in code or cipher? Good questions. Up until the late 1970s, it was universally assumed that Burr had written the cipher letter. It's only been in the last four decades that there's been any question about that. And in the late 70s, there was a project to publish the Burr papers, just as they are projects to publish many of the other papers of important figures from that period. And the editors raised questions about whether this was really a Burr letter, whether it in fact been written by somebody else. I'm pretty skeptical about that. And I spend a few pages in my book talking through why I think we need to understand this as a Burr letter even if it may not have been in his handwriting, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not his letter. And that was sort of their strongest evidence that it wasn't a Burr letter. The letter came to Jefferson already translated. In fact, he didn't see the letter, the physical letter itself for months after he had sent the translation of it to the public and to Congress. And it had been translated by Wilkinson. And there clearly was a code that Wilkinson and Burr shared. It was in multiple parts. One part was sort of hieroglyphic symbols, one part was numbers, and one part was what was called a dictionary code, where they had the same edition of a dictionary, they numbered the pages the same, and they had the same rules for how to interpret the numbers for in terms of what column something would be in, and they would use that for their letters. So Wilkinson, in some ways, was probably the only person who could decipher it and sent a deciphered, but also somewhat uh, transformed copy to the president in late December, early January of 1807. And I somewhat transformed in the sense that he did things that distanced himself from the letter. He took out, for example, a line that said, your letter of May, whatever, is received, right? So he wanted to make it look like this came to me out of the blue. I had no idea what he was talking about. I just happened to be able to decipher the letter because we've shared this code for years. But in fact, there was a prior history of writing between them. He eventually would share these other coded letters that they had passed between them. Now, before we started talking about Wilkinson, you mentioned that the men who arrested Burr were en route to Washington, D.C. when they received notice that Burr would be tried in Richmond. What was Burr's trial like and why was it held in Richmond and not Washington, D.C.? Well, that would ultimately be an issue of debate as well. He's taken back to Richmond in part because the circuit court there is under the control of the Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall. He lived there and rode circuit there as well. And so there was somebody there who could decide whether Burr could be held on the charge of treason or not. The other reason he was taken there is that in some ways, the best place to make that charge was Blennerhassett Island. Now, if you look at a map now, you would think that Blennerhassett Island was either in West Virginia or possibly Ohio. But West Virginia, of course, was a part of Virginia back then. And so the circuit that Marshall presided over included the whole of Virginia, and it included Blennerhassett Island. So that's, in some ways, the logic that brings him there. There are later discussions between the attorneys and the judge over, why did he stay here? Why did anyone decide that this was the fit place for this trial? And each kind of accused the other of being responsible for that decision. Why was Blennerhassett Island seen as the only place where the government could make the argument that Burr was at least involved in some sort of treasonous activity? Well, the law of treason was pretty clear. It's right there in the Constitution. And treason consists of either of two things, levying war against the United States or providing aid and comfort to the nation's enemies. Well, the nation didn't have any enemies in 1806, so they had to find a way of saying that it was a case of levying war against the United States. And at Blennerhassett Island, 
there had been a number of men who had come down river from the Pittsburgh area in boats. They were waiting for additional boats that were coming from Marietta. They had supplies. They had been seen from the nearby shore doing stuff that looked military, keeping what they called signal fires, keeping watch, and possibly making bullets. And there was at least one report that said that when representative of the Ohio militia arrived to arrest these men, that guns were levied against him, that some of these men raised their rifles to make him leave. And so there's a way that one might think that that was levying war against the United States. There are also ways in which there was a highly dubious charge. He was not a representative of the United States. He wasn't even within his own jurisdiction once he crossed over to the island. Now, when you read James's book, The Burr Conspiracy, you really get the idea that Aaron Burr's treason trial was really one of the first sensational trials in the United States. It's kind of something we would look on today as a trial of the century kind of trial. And yet this trial turned out to be kind of a dud. James, would you tell us about Aaron Burr's trial and why it transformed from this sensational event into something that kind of proved to be anticlimactic? It's a very long trial. And it was understood at the time as being a huge event trial, not just because of the charge, but also because of everything that surrounded it. So we think of a trial of the century as we almost think of it as something that couldn't have happened in the past because it needs mass media. It needs the 24-hour news cycle. It needs the kind of furor that can surround something like the O.J. Simpson trial, for example. But all of those things were there in 1807 in Richmond. In just in a different form. It did have the attention of all of the media of the day. Newspapers all across the country were providing information about what was going on in Richmond. And in some ways, it was far more significant than any modern trial of the century. Think about who's involved in it. The former vice president of the United States is the defendant. The chief justice of the Supreme Court is the deciding judge in all of this. It had some of the most important lawyers in the country at that time. It had the commanding general of the United States Army as one of the witnesses. It had the president kind of hovering off in the wings, providing some information and some instructions. The president is subpoenaed on two occasions during the trial. So all of these things get wrapped up into this trial. But you're right. It is in many ways anticlimactic. It's very frustrating for the people who are convinced that Burr was guilty of treason. Because while he's indicted for treason, along with six others, in June of 1807, he's ultimately found not guilty, and in a way that leaves a lot of people very uncomfortable, because Marshall ultimately arrests the testimony, the witness testimony, fairly early on in late August, early September 1807, because the defense attorneys say, look, our guy wasn't there. You can't accuse him of treason when he wasn't at Blennerhassett Island. The place and date are spelled out very clearly in the indictment. And it is true that Burr simply was not there. So the question became, how much are we going to accept an idea from English common law, the idea of constructive treason, that you can be a part of a treason without actually being present at that moment? That was something that the English had accepted and used quite aggressively, in fact, and something that Marshall eventually decided we were not going to bring into American jurisprudence. John Marshall's ruling in Aaron Burr's treason trial is really interesting to me because Marshall tended to interpret the Constitution broadly. But in this case, in Burr's case, he followed a more strict interpretation of the Constitution, which actually happened to be Thomas Jefferson's preferred style of constitutional interpretation. So I wonder, what did Thomas Jefferson make of Marshall's ruling that there just wasn't enough evidence to proceed with the charge of treason? Well, you're right. It's very interesting because in some ways, Marshall and the Federalists were much looser in their construction than Jefferson and the Republicans had been. In this case, at this point in the case, at least, stands that on its head. Jefferson and the prosecuting attorneys are trying to make a case based on this idea of constructive treason. And Marshall is trying to back away from it to draw a very clear line that says that that's not something that will accept in American law. And Jefferson is furious about it. Jefferson decides Pretty much at the moment that Marshall hands down his decision and Jefferson learns about his decision a few days later, that we're going to find some way to get the evidence that should have been presented in court before the American people, 
and even more importantly, before Congress. And they figure out a couple of different ways to do that. The trial actually goes through two more stages after that initial not guilty verdict, one where Burr is tried on the misdemeanor of trying to levy war against Spanish Mexico or Spanish Florida, and then another hearing to decide whether he can be committed for retrial someplace else other than Virginia. And at each of those stages, the government brings out more witnesses, gets more material out into the newspapers, and also gets more of their testimony down in a very legal form that can be put before Congress. And that's exactly what Jefferson does. In December of 1807, he sends a group of documents, sort of a record of the trial that is shaped to serve his ends. What are his ends? His ends are to get Congress and the people to change the Constitution, not about treason, but about the power and position of justices. He thinks that the fact that justices are are allowed to serve for life and are essentially unimpeachable, though one had been impeached, is at odds with Republican government, that the people have embraced the Republican Party, the philosophy of the Republican Party, but the fact that there are all these Federalist appointed judges in various levels of federal courts has frustrated this Republican revolution that Jefferson sees himself as embodying. And he wants to use the Burr trial to change the Constitution in a way that checks the power of the courts. So, how do Americans react to the outcome of all this that the courts acquit Burr of all charges? Well, the vast majority were convinced that he had gotten off only through legal finagling both his own and that of his attorneys, but especially that of Marshall. And in November of 1807, when Burr and some of his friends and associates are passing north through Baltimore, there is a sort of a mass uprising. They don't go after the men themselves, but they burn Marshall and Burr and Harmon Blennerhass in effigy. There's a sort of a day-long march through Baltimore, ending on Gallows Hill with the burning of these effigies. And There are places around the country and newspapers around the country that say, you know, this is how we should be voicing our dissatisfaction with how the trial has proceeded with the fact that Burr has been allowed to go free. And what happened to Burr after the trial? Legally, he was acquitted of all charges, but it sounds like the American people thought that he had gained the system. So what was his life like after all of this? Well, he left the country within about six months or so. He left the country to go to Europe. He spent the next four years in Europe. And he came back in uh, the summer of 1812, just sort of on the eve of the War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain. And he lays pretty low from then on out. He survives for another 13, 14 years, but he's a New York lawyer. He's not prominent in any way. He's not really political in any way at that point. And he's sort of a reminder of what can happen but not really somebody that most people associated with, that most people kept track of in any sort of way. Now, James notes in his book, The Burr Conspiracy, that we'll likely never know what Aaron Burr's true intentions and motivations for his activities out West were because we lack sources of information on this account. James, before we move into the time warp, would you tell us why we seem to lack sources about this really big and important historical event and why you think we're still searching for answers about the Burr conspiracy today? There are lots of questions that historians have about the past that we find that we can't answer because of sources. This doesn't seem like it should be one of those, right? So we want to know about the thought processes of slaves, and that's very hard to get at. These are the kinds of people who kept records, who wrote travel journals or diaries or letters or gave speeches. But when you get down to really the most important people here, Burr, Wilkinson and Jefferson. We find that in the case of Burr in particular, a lot of material has gone missing. It's not entirely clear when it went missing. A lot of accounts would say that he left his letters with his daughter when he went to Europe in 1808. She came up to meet him in late 1812, early 1813, after he returned to New York, and her ship went down off Cape Hatteras, and that the letters must have been with her. And there were accounts as early as the 1830s that said that. There are also accounts from the mid-1830s, though, that where his first biographer said, oh, I've got tons of documents, even from the period of the conspiracy, but they don't exist anymore. These people also, Wilkinson, Jefferson, and Burr, they were not writing for us, and they were not writing to be truthful. They were writing for the time. 
And they were writing to protect themselves in some cases, to advance various plans. So when you look at what is available, you have to treat a lot of it with skepticism. I said that there was a project to pull together Burr's documents in the 1970s, and there are not a lot of them. And when you look at the ones from the period of the Burr conspiracy, you find that a lot of them have come to us, not because we have a draft that Burr wrote or the letter that Burr wrote. We have a document that Wilkinson submitted to Congress to protect himself in the early 18-teens or submitted to a court-martial when he was under court-martial and under investigation for his role in the conspiracy in the early 18-teens. These are not totally reliable sources, right? We have somebody who's got to be very careful about what he allows to go out to the world in control of some of what we have about Burr. We have people who he talked to saying, oh, here's what Burr told me was going on. But these people are also often very guarded. They don't want to say, yeah, I was sitting down talking with Burr about dividing the union, right? They're never going to say that. They talk about, we were going to prepare for a war against Spain. And we were going to prepare for a war against Spain only if the United States declared war against Spain. We were going to have a volunteer corps ready to join up in the army. So all of the sources we have are quite guarded, are quite likely to be written to serve the interests of their authors rather than to serve our needs, which are finding out what happened. Now, the other question, why do we still care? In some ways, ultimately, I decided I didn't care. I didn't care what Burr was really up to. I found it far more interesting to learn how these vague rumors, these conflicting reports, reach the level of the crisis in the minds of Americans. Why are so many people talking about it? Why are so many people worrying about it? What does that allow us to understand when we look at Americans in this time period? What does that allow us to get at? What fears are they voicing? And how are their fears, their fears about the fragility of the union, about the durability of Republican governments, how are those fears ultimately shaping in their minds what they've decided Burr is up to? It's quite a feedback loop. They see enough to make them worry. And then once they see enough to make them worry, they already have the story of what to be afraid of. They have the story and they just need to fill the slots in, right? And so Burr, who's known as an ambitious guy, fits very easily in their stories about ambitious demagogues and men who try to bring down republics and men who try to divide United Nations. So that became much more interesting to me pretty quickly in this process. And it was a nearly a 20-year process. Pretty quickly, I realized I wasn't going to be able to answer the old questions, that I better find a new set of questions that were more compelling to me. And these questions about how information moved, how people took confusion and made enough clarity out of it to act, how they made sense of the world around them. Those questions became much more compelling to me than the old questions about what Burr was really up to, why Jefferson responded the way he did, how did Marshall let him go free, what was Wilkinson's role in all of this. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Ruth would like to know, in your opinion, what might have happened if Burr's wife, Theodosia Bartow Prevost, hadn't died in 1794? If Theodosia had lived, do you think she would have tried to convince Burr not to involve himself in such a curious and conspiratorial plan? Well, that's a great question. And it taps into one of these contemporary understandings. One of the things I found as I was doing this is that there were people at the time saying, why is Burr doing this? Because he's a bachelor, right? Bachelors can get involved in these wild schemes in a way that family men cannot. And there are, in fact, a number of people Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who was one of the architects of the Capitol, wrote some letters in which he made very clear, look, you know, Burr talked to me. He didn't say anything about this union, but he did lay out these grand plans for this new settlement in the West. And he had a big role for me in that. And if I didn't have a family, I might have gotten involved in it. And so, you know, nobody could possibly know what either Theodosia, the daughter or the mother's ability to slow this down would have been. But it's certainly interesting that so many of the people at the time thought that this was a factor, 
the bachelors, wild bachelors, they were sometimes called, were not constrained, not simply by the law, but by these more important constraints, the constraints that come with responsibility, with family, with duties that would prevent you from doing something stupid. You mentioned that it took you 20 years to complete your work on the Burr conspiracy. Have you chosen a new research project yet? Well, it's not that easy to do. You know, 20 years cast a long shadow and, and, you know, it's now seven months after it came out and I'm still talking about it. And there's been a fair bit of that going on, which is great. I love talking about it. I love meeting various audiences and getting to people in different ways. So I'm still thinking about it. I have something percolating around back there. I'm at a point in my career where I can wait a little while and decide what the next batch of compelling questions is. I don't want to just go charging off into something because I feel some sort of pressure to get a next book out. I don't have that pressure. I have the ability to do some reading, to do some thinking, and to have a question come to me that says, you can't find the answer to this, right? Nobody seems to have answered this question in a way that you're satisfied with. I think that's when history is at its best. I think that's uh, something that people don't always understand about history is that just like all of the other disciplines around a college campus, it's a question answering and problem solving discipline. And when we attack it with questions that are compelling to us that we feel like we have to have an answer to, that carries us through the work, which can be quite long. But it also, I think, makes it very interesting for the reader because then all you have to do is convince them the questions are worth answering for them to want to follow you on the journey of the article or the book or the lecture, however you're delivering the information to them. There was a lot of detail, characters and evidence involved in the Burr conspiracy, and we've just scratched the surface of it. So if we have more questions about things we've discussed or details we may read in your book, how can we contact you? Well, the best way is through email. It's the easiest way for me to process things. There's a Kalamazoo College History Department website, and I'm on there with my Vita and my email information. But I can also just tell you, it's all lowercase, J Lewis, L E W I S, at K Z O O dot E D U. James Lewis, thank you so much for taking us through the Burr Conspiracy and helping us grapple with it. You're very welcome. The Burr Conspiracy took place between 1805 and 1807, and it supposedly involved Aaron Burr and a number of other men conspiring to divide the Mississippi Valley states and territories from the Federal Union to establish a new independent country, which, again, depending on the sources you read, might have also included parts of Spanish Florida and Mexico. Now, did Aaron Burr really try to organize this disunion project and intend to commit treason? As James revealed, we don't have enough information or historical sources to definitively answer those questions. Of course, as we heard, Neither did the Jefferson administration or the American people. For whatever reason, we lack records that dive into Burr's plans and ideas. However, what the evidence does tell us is that Burr went west, that many people suspected him of being up to no good, and that's really what we have. And this kind of makes sense when you think about it. If Burr really did have a plan in mind to divide the Union, and he committed his plans to paper, then the chances of him getting caught would have increased a lot because then there would have been a paper trail. So Burr didn't leave us with a paper trail, but he does leave us with a valuable lesson. When we look at the records of the past, we always need to consider why someone created a specific record. What did they hope to accomplish by writing a letter? Why did they choose to include the information they did? What information might they have left out of that record? And when we can't find documents about the people we want to know more about, we need to ask, Why does that person or why do those people lack a paper trail? Of course, as James noted, sometimes the lack of documentation can be a good thing because it forces us to ask different questions of the past. In the case of the Burr conspiracy, a lack of reliable documentation from and about Burr on his motivations caused James to look at the Burr conspiracy in a whole new way. So rather than ask and try to solve the questions of whether Burr intended to commit treason and if so, why? James instead asked questions about Americans' reactions to the crisis. What information did Americans have about the crisis? How did they use that information to craft narratives to explain what was going on? And what do those created narratives reveal about what Americans thought about the crisis and how they felt about it? As James revealed, when we look at the Burr conspiracy through the lens of how Americans followed and viewed the crisis, we get a picture that Americans feared for the durability of the American Union and feared for the safety and survival of a Republican government in North America. And that's a really interesting point. 
it reveals that the Burr conspiracy proved to be a crisis, not necessarily because there was a plan to divide the Union, but because Americans at that time really feared and believed that dividing the Union was a possibility. You can find more information about James, his book, The Burr Conspiracy, plus the notes I took for you on this conversation on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 204. The Omohundro Institute has been the proud publisher of award-winning books since 1943. And in their newest publication, Frontiers of Science, author Cameron Strang explores the contributions Gulf South residents made to American scientific knowledge during the 150-year period between 1500 and 1750. If you're curious about the history of science, you should really check out this book. And thanks to the generosity of the Omohundro Institute and their publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press, you can save 50% off your purchase when you visit benfranklinsworld.com science and use promo code 01BFW. Finally, historians ask a lot of questions about history. What are some of your questions? I love questions and I'm curious about yours, so send them to me. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.